I'm going to introduce our speaker tonight, which all of you know, um, Pastor Jamie. Uh, he has served faithfully. Yeah. He's served faithfully uh, the children of this church and has sown uh, into the next generation for uh, uh, decades now. And uh, he's now uh, transitioned into an executive role within Riverhouse and uh, really has been uh, just a godsend to this church. And there are so many things uh, that he does behind the scenes that no one knows, no one sees, and he just has stewarded with excellence. Uh, River House. And so all of you have benefited from this man's life, from his faith, from his integrity, and from his humility to come and serve. And uh, truly, when God was coming, he told me, he said, he's going he's gonna to be a Jonathan to you, and he's going to help uh, see this vision that I've put within your heart come to fruition. And so I just honor you, Jamie, for how you've served me, for how you've served this house. And uh, we're privileged tonight to get to hear uh, the word that uh, God has given Pastor Jamie. So let's honor him as he comes uh, to share with us tonight. Well, good evening. I felt like after the baptisms, I didn't even need to preach. That You got sermon after sermon after sermon right here in the front row. That was amazing and encouraging. And uh, actually, we're going to springboard off of that. Because what tonight's message is about is um, called returning to your first love. And right here, we saw the first love. I don't know what your story is when you made the decision when you got baptized or when you chose to follow God. But after that moment, sometimes life happens and things happen and the enemy's sneaky and he tries, tries to wiggle in. And so tonight's message is going to be about uh, returning to our first love. And I got it uh, at the beginning of November. I was in the prayer room and uh, at the office and I was praying. And when I was praying, the Lord was talking to me. And one of the things he said is, you're going to be preaching again soon. And I said, okay, what's my topic? And this is what he said. I want you to tell Riverhouse, return to your first love. And so I began to study that. And a couple days after that, Jordan comes to me and says, hey, I, I think you're supposed to preach again. And I said, yeah, the Lord just told me that. And um, here's the message I have. And we couldn't connect a date to do it. It just there was conflict after conflict. But tonight was the night. Tonight's the night, and you're here. And uh, I was in Iowa for, for Christmas break, and I, my prayer was, God, whoever needs to be here tonight, make sure they're here. And you're here. So I'm celebrating that. And tonight, uh, I think God has a word to speak through this. And I'm going to start with the scripture, and then I'll open a prayer. Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 through 4 says, To the church of Ephesus, Right. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, and I'll pause right here. This is Jesus talking to John kind of dictating to him, here's what I want you to share to the church in Ephesus. And the first part of what I just read, if you want to summarize, is a bunch of good things. Read it. They're good things. They were doing good things. And yet, the last line of this passage, nevertheless, I you that you have left your first love. Let's pray. God, tonight I just ask you would come in a powerful way. I ask for your anointing to be on the words that I prepared. They're just words on a paper without you breathing life into them. And I ask that you would breathe your spirit into this message. That you would minister to every heart here. May they get what's applicable to them. May they understand it and have ears to hear it, God. So I pray that you would just use me and give everyone here ears to hear what you're trying to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of the stories that um, God showed me, it was actually while I was on vacation in Iowa, he gave me this picture of a memory that I completely forgot about. And it was over 20 years ago. And 
back then, Kim and I were newly married, and I, we lived in Nashville, Tennessee, and her family's from Michigan. And so periodically, we'd go home to see her parents, and we'd take I-65 on up and head up to Michigan. Well, one of our ventures home to Michigan, we were traveling, and we had to get gas or go to the rest area, get food. I don't remember what the reason was, but it doesn't matter. We pulled off. We took care of business, and then we get back on the interstate, and we're driving along. And as we're driving along, we both kind of look at each other like, that looks familiar. I didn't know one of those were here. And then we're driving again, and just like, wait. And we saw a sign finally. The sign said, Nashville, 120 miles ahead. We were on the way to Michigan, folks, so that means... <laughs> We got back on the interstate, but we were going the wrong direction. We didn't know we were going the wrong direction. It wasn't intentional, but we were. And it wasn't until we noticed the signs that we realized, well, we need to make a U-turn. This isn't where we wanted to head. This isn't the direction we wanted to go. Well, tonight, the Lord, so I, I, I got that vision, and I said, well, God, what does this have to do with return to first love? And he said, Talk about some of the signs that you're leaving your first love, the warning signs, so that they can pay attention to, oh, wait a second, am I going the right way? And so tonight's message is very simple. It's signs that you could be heading in the wrong direction from your first love. First one, neglect, the sign of neglect. In Hebrews 2.3, the author was writing to a group of Jewish Christians who were going backward rather than forward in their faith. He raises this fundamental mental question. How shall we neglect so great a salvation? To neglect simply means to pay no attention to or lack of interest. It's not that you're intentionally doing wrong things. It's that you're not doing the right things. So... I'm a kid's pastor in the past, so I make it simple. I'm going to give you a couple just examples of what, how this kind of plays out in life um, in other areas. The first one, if you think back to high school or if you're in high school or junior high, just being a student, you don't have to be disruptive in class in order to fail. All you have to do is not study. If you kept up a semester of being good, all semester you were in the front row you were smiling at the teacher. You took notes, and you were the best student in class. But at home, you never studied. You never opened the book. You never researched whatever the teacher assigned. Guess what's going to happen at the end of the semester? You will fail. You will fail the class, even though you were good. One more. When you see a marriage and a divorce, it doesn't always mean that someone committed adultery. It may mean that the husband has been stuck in front of the television too long. The dating stopped. The compliments ceased. No more doors got opened. Neglecting your spouse in marriage can open the door to a failed marriage. So none of those things I rattled off were sins or big major things, but it's the neglect of that relationship that can cause it to fail. So we gave you an example of a student. If you neglect your studies, it's going to fail. We gave you an example of a marriage. If you neglect to keep things going in your marriage, it's going to fail. Now we're going to take that same principle into our relationship with God. If you neglect to pray, to read your Bible, to spend time in his presence, guess what? You're going to wander away from your first love. It's very subtle. It's very sneaky. But it's a way that we can kind of just coast along and not realize we actually are going the wrong direction. Warning sign number one is neglect. Today's culture is really good at having a Netflix life and binging certain episodes that come out and, oh, I got to watch the whole season in a day. We're real good at having a Facebook life. Oh, I got my posts in. Oh, I got a new friend. Oh, they loved my post. We're real good at having an Instagram life. Oh, did you see who saw my story? Oh, look at all my followers. We're real good at having a sports life and following our favorite teams, and we know everything about them. But tonight I want to ask this question. 
That's great that you have all those, but do you have a prayer life? Do you have a prayer life, or is Netflix getting the most of your time? Now I get to tattle on my own self. Because honestly, this message was like holding a mirror and preaching it to myself. Week after week, as I, from November on, the Lord has been his thumb in my back with things that I don't want to tell you right now, but I get to. <laughs> Go ahead and put the picture of balloon TD battles. You're probably sitting there wondering, what on earth does this have to do with returning to your first love. Let me give you a little explanation. You can go to the next screen too so they can see what an amazing game this is. <laughs> okay, now here's what happened. From about August through, well, till now, I mean, we just got a children's special, but from August through December, I had started phasing into the executive role, but was also still doing children's ministry. And it began to be a big load. It was just like I was trying to power through it, but it was a lot. There was just taking on more. We needed stuff done. And so it was just kind of happened. And during that time, it's just like I would work all day, just your go, 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 go. Then I come home, we'd have dinner. My, Kim might need something, or there's chores on the farm. And you you just you're you're going. We have we have a health coaching business. I did stuff with that in the evenings. And by the time I would get to bed sometimes, I would just be like, <sighs> you ever been there? Yeah. Okay. And I was like, oh, so certain nights I would just be, <sighs> and so I'd be in bed beside Kim. I'd get out my iPad, and this is a game my teenage son introduced me to years ago. <laughs> it's a mindless game. You could play other people. And I was like, oh, I deserve to just veg right now. Amen. And I <laughs> began to just play balloon battles. It's 10 o'clock at night and I'm playing balloon battles. And before I know it, I can barely keep my eyes open. It's one in the morning. And where did that three hours go? But guess what? Then the next morning, there is something I didn't, wasn't as eager to do. There was something I began to neglect. And it wasn't balloon battles. <laughs> I began to neglect my first love. Oh, I'm too tired to pray right now. I got to get to work. And then I get to work and it's grind, 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 grind. Even though there's a prayer room 20 steps away. Yes, the pastor, a pastor, neglected his first love because of balloon battles. <laughs> it sounds almost humiliating to even say it out loud, but I don't know what your balloon battles is, but I bet you have some. I bet there's some things in your life that are getting way too much attention, and it's not that they're sins. It wasn't a sin to play balloon battles, but what happened is I was neglecting my first love, and what happens when you neglect stuff? It starts to fail starts to go the wrong direction. And God doesn't want us going the wrong direction. He loves us spending time with him. So don't neglect your first love. So say neglect. You're going the wrong way. Warning sign. If you're neglecting your time with the king, you're going the wrong way. You're on your way to Nashville, Tennessee <laughs> when you need to be going to Michigan. Okay? Number two. Road sign number two, busyness. We're all, mm hmm because we know what that is. That's the culture of our day and age. Busyness. I call it the Martha syndrome. Most of us have heard the Martha story in the Bible. In case you're new to church, I'm going to read it to you. So you can just kind of see, because Jesus is in this story, and he addresses busyness head on. Um, verse 38 of chapter 10 in the book of Luke says, Now while they were on their way, Jesus entered a village called Bethany. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who seated herself at the Lord's feet and was continually, say continually. Which, that one word actually highlighted to me. Continually. She was continually listening to his teaching. But Martha 
She was very busy and distracted with all of her serving responsibilities, and she approached Jesus and said, Lord, is it of no concern to you that my sister has left me to do the serving alone? Tell her to help me and do her part. But the Lord replied to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered and anxious about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, that which is to her advantage, which will not be taken away from her. One of the byproducts of getting so busy in this passage, did you catch it? You're worried. You're bothered. You're anxious about so many things. I propose to you, if you're worried, you're bothered, and you're anxious, that might be a clue that you're not spending time with the king. Because yeah. when you spend time with Jesus, his peace that surpasses all understanding comes Amen. and floods our heart. And so what's the most important thing to Jesus? Serving him or spending time with him? Yeah. Spending time with him. If you look in Revelation 2, 2 through 4, which is a scripture I opened with, you'll notice the same problem there tucked in that story was the thing to fall. Ephesus was doing all these things, their works, their labor. They were being patient. They weren't listening to false preachers. And they persevered. They had patience. But guess what? What did he tell them? Nevertheless, I have this against you that you've left your first love. Busyness is a subtle trick of the enemy. My wife likes it when I help her clean the house, when I mow the yard, when I uh, wash her car and vacuum it out. But she would be the first to tell you that if I did all I did was that for her but never spent time with her, she would be unfulfilled. You see, what she wants more than all my acts of love she wants my time. She wants me to spend time with her. That's the most important thing. And it's the very same thing with God. That's great that you're serving. That's great you're leading a revival group. That's great that you're volunteering downtown with that organization. That's great that you've taken this person under your wing. That's great you're mentoring all these people. But guess what? If it comes at the price yeah. of spending time with Jesus, you turned around from your first love. Some people do these things because, oh, I love God, so I'm going to be in this and do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. And all these acts of love become the focus, and they've lost their focus on loving the person that they're serving. So road sign number two that you're on the wrong path is busyness. Say busyness. Okay, busyness. First one was neglect. Second one, busyness. Okay, and I'm not saying don't do acts of service, don't volunteer in the kids' ministry, don't do all these things, but I'm saying spend time with God. Out of your time with God is the outflow of all those things. But if those things become the focus, you're misguided. Okay, that's the, that. Okay, number three. Roadside number three is refusal. Refusal. Refusal to surrender any area of your life that God has been speaking to you about. Let's say it again. Refusal to surrender any area of your life that God has been speaking to you about. That can play out in, through it. Enormous cat. I mean, just I could go all night on that topic alone, but just think through it. Maybe there's a friendship he's had to let go of. You've given him everything but that friendship. If you're refusing to let go of that, you're actually going the wrong direction. It's getting to the level in our lives where we surrender whatever he says, whether it's balloon battles. A friendship, a TV show. I mean, Holy Spirit's probably bringing something to your mind now if there is something you're refusing. 
It could literally be all over the place. Refusal. He gave me three other areas just specifically to highlight because honestly, you could go all over and some of them just almost sound elementary, but I'm just going to do what he said. Um, the first one, refusal to willingly and cheerfully give to God's work or to the needs of others. That's a sign you're going in the wrong direction. I'm not giving to earn God's love. I'm not giving, I'm not saying that. I'm saying because I love God so much, I want to give. He gave his only son. And if you, if I were to open your checkbook or you were to open mine, you could tell what I love by seeing where, how I spend my money. Oh, wow. Jamie likes Chick-fil-A. Uh, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> okay. And if, if your love doesn't include God, you can't give to God. Do you think you're moving towards your first love? You're refusing to, oh, you can have everything but my money. It's a telltale sign that what started here, like these guys had, you're putting a wall up and you're turning from your first love. Another one, and this is almost um, paradoxical to say this one because you're here, but this is what he really had my, his thumb in my back. When you refuse to meet up with and fellowship with the people of God, Acts 2.42 says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Hebrews 10.25 says, And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. You know, some people might even be listening to this message online. And they say, oh, I don't need to go to church. I could just watch it online. And that's their church now. And it's not because they can't, they don't have transportation or they're sick. I'm not talking about that, but it's, it's a substitute. If you're refusing to meet with the body of Christ, that's a sign that you're walking away from your first love. I'm not the one that says it's good for you. He does. So don't get mad at me. God wants you to be, we need each other. I'm looking around at these faces and I could just see so many people, the different gifts you bring to the table. I need you. You need me. We need each other. So if you just happen to be visiting here and, and maybe you haven't been here in four months, God's saying to you, make this a priority this year. Spend time. It'll help you. It'll help you grow in your relationship with him. See, the other one, and this kind of actually has two in it, that's within refusal, um, is I'm going to share a little bit of my wife's story. I'm not going to go into the whole testimony. I'm going to give you a Cliff Notes version. But this is on refusing to forgive. Somebody who's offended you. A church who's wounded you. And you're holding on to unforgiveness. And her story powerfully illustrates the power of forgiveness. So when she was 23 months old, she lived in Michigan, and her and her mom and her, her siblings were going blueberry picking. And this is in the days before they even had car seats. So you would literally have kids standing in the back, laying on the floor. It was not like today. And so they were driving on a country Michigan road, and they're driving along in their car, and this direction, there is a stop sign right here. And Madeline was the driver of this car, and instead of stopping, she full throttle, no stop, full acceleration, went right in to Kim's car. And so you could put, I got some pictures I found. And there's the side, one side of the car. There's another picture, another and another. What happened was the kids were thrown from the car. Kim's mom was thrown from the car. And the car rolled into a ditch on top of Kim. And her feet were dangling out kind of like the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> but praise the Lord, it rained. Because of the rain and the mud, when the car landed on her, it pushed her into the mud. Pushed her into the ground. And so her mom comes to 
sees the car, looks for her babies, and where's Kim, where's Kim? Sees her feet, runs over, and adrenaline plus, I believe, the power of God, lifts the car, <laughs> yanks the door off, and uh, Kim's uncle happened to be driving by, had a shovel in the back of his truck, and they dug Kim out. So that seems, oh, that's traumatic. Whew, she made it through. That was just the beginning. What they didn't know what happened is when the, the car fell on top of Kim, the antifreeze and the chemicals in the car mixed together and poured on Kim's body. So I have a picture of that. And three-fourths of, or uh, is it one-fourth, 25%? Help me. One-third. It was none of the above. One third of her body was third degree burned. And so that led to her going into a burn unit and over, not even just when she's a toddler, but she went through 15 to 20 surgeries, plastic surgeries from that moment all the way through high school. They were doing skin graftings. When she was in high school, she had saline solution shot in her stomach to expand it so they could cut that off and patch it on her legs. And so they did skin grafting. Well, it made her look pregnant. I mean, no, people aren't nice in school. You can say names, you can be mean. And so she was made fun of a lot. She missed a lot of school because of the surgeries. So then she began the self-talk of I'm dumb. I'm stupid. And she had all this going on there's stories I could go into from in her freshman year of high school in math. She's sitting there, and she has a scar on her head. She covers it with her hair, but that particular day, her hair didn't cover the scar correctly. And one of the girls came up to her after math class and said, could you please cover your scar? It was glaring at me all class. Hurtful things. Well, Kim didn't necessarily want to take her anger out on those people that were saying all the mean things. Who do you think she wanted to take it out on? Madeline, the driver of the car. So over time and surgery after surgery and wound after wound of being made fun of and all these major, she harbored major bitterness, major resentment, major hatred. And it was in her college year, she was in a singing group, for the college, and they were doing a, a high school camp, and the guy, the guest speaker, spoke on forgiveness. And at the end, the Lord told her, this wasn't just for the high schoolers. This message was for you. I want you to forgive Madeline. So she wrestled, and she finally came up and said, God, I choose to forgive Madeline for everything she did to me. And then he didn't stop. I want you to call your mom and tell her, when you come home next for Christmas break to ask if you can meet with Madeline, I want you to tell Madeline you forgive her. Well, she hadn't seen Madeline since the accident. So that stirred up a lot, but she did it. Long story short, her and Madeline met. And she looked her in the eyes and said, Madeline, I forgive you. And Madeline, you can imagine, had held in all this guilt all these years, gushed in tears, and they hugged. And that was the beginning of Kim's journey of forgiveness. I believe she wouldn't be doing what she's doing today. I wouldn't be where I'm at today because she's my rock. She's an amazing wife. If she hadn't chosen to forgive and return to her first love, that one act propelled her towards Jesus, I believe, in one of the most significant ways in her life. So I don't know who's been wounded, jaded, somebody's abused you, and who's harboring that, but God wants you to just let it go. Kim could come up here at the mic and shout it from the rooftops. The best decision she made, letting it go and doing it God's way. While we were worshiping, the Lord gave me one more thing with this story. I didn't tell it last service, but he said, do it this one. One of the things that Kim did in this journey is that because of all the name-calling and the low self-esteem and people making fun of her, all these things adding up, she would go to her room and she would grab a mirror and look. You are 
You are so stupid. You are so ugly. You will never be married. And she spoke curse after curse over herself. The why it chokes me up is because at the beginning of our marriage, I had to grab her and take her to the mirror and said, undo it. Undo it. You are loved. You are beautiful. God loves you. And so she did it with tears. She kicked and screamed in her heart, but she did it, and it broke. And God wants, what God was telling me in worship, he said, some people are refusing to believe what I say about them. If you're refusing to believe what God says about you, that's a telltale sign. You're wandering away from your first love. That's not his voice. That's not his nature. So whoever that was for, take it, okay? Go home and get out your mirror and tell yourself who you really are, who God says you are. All right, I'm totally lost in my notes. All right. We're going to close with this. The prodigal son story, which you've probably heard, if you've been to church at all, in Luke chapter 15, I'm just going to paraphrase it. We read about the parable of the prodigal son who left his father. He decided to do things his own way and actually chose wild living. He didn't realize the direction he was heading. It was the wrong way. I envision this prodigal son thinking that he was doing, what he was doing was no big deal. Honestly, it's a lie the enemy has done since the story of Adam and Eve. It's no big deal. You can have a little. It's no big deal to do that. It's no big deal to watch that. It's no big deal. And so we see that playing out in the story, and the son's rebellion eventually caught up with him, and he went from being in the father's house to being where? The pig pen. The father's house to the pig pen. He finally came to his senses, though, and decided to at least try and return home and see if his father would let him work as a hired servant. Verse 20. I'll actually read right from the text. So he returned home to his father. And Garrett, if you want to come play keys, I don't even know where you are uh, for this closing. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Why am I telling that story to close with? It's a beautiful illustration. That if you've wandered from the Father, it's never too late to turn back around. Because why? He's standing there with his arms wide open. He's standing there ready to put a ring on your finger. He's standing there to put sandals on your feet. He's standing there to clothe you in his robes. He's not mad. He's throwing a party. Some of you, this message is not to make you feel condemned or guilty or you got to strive and do more. This is the opposite of that. This message is go and spend time with Jesus and enjoy yourself. Let go of the things that are pulling you from him and say enough is enough. Enough balloon TD battles. I'm going to go be with the king. Enough Netflix. Enough Facebook. Enough, enough, enough. Who's with me and wanting to start 2019 with their first love? First love. First love. 
If you'll dim the lights, we'll just have the ministry team come up. The last slide, the, the final slide on the um, that scripture from Revelation 2.5 says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. So that I showed you that whole scripture about the church of Ephesus and they did all those works that Jesus said. You've forgotten your first love. He goes on to say this. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. There's three R's and this is, will take me 15 seconds to say we can look from the son and the prodigal. Number one, remember. Remember your salvation experience. Remember your relationship with the Father. Remember what it was like that night you testified. The son had to remember. He remembered in the pig pen his father's place. Number two, repent. Give up the thoughts, the attitudes, the complacency, the actions that took you down the wrong road. And then the son did number three. He returned. Return to your commitment to your first love. If you want to, if that's you tonight, and you want to start 2019 turning back to your first love, ministry time is available for you. You're coming up here and you're declaring, or maybe you need prayer for something or whatever. If you want to take an inventory from your seat, search my heart, oh God. Show me. Show me, is there anything in me? So God, I just thank you for tonight. Thank you for every person that's here. I thank you for your word, which doesn't return null and void, but it accomplishes its purpose. And tonight, you want people to return to their first love. And I just decree and declare that this church, these people, people listening by podcast, will return to their first love. That this will be a spark that will set the whole forest on fire, God. It'll be like a forest fire of your presence. People who are on fire for you. So let it begin tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And you are dismissed.